Greetings and welcome back. Uh, we finished up the Supreme Court last time and now we move to what I think is a much more exciting uh, topic, uh, civil liberties, which I, I've titled uh, Civil Liberties for Me But Not Thee. Uh, there are five overviews that uh, I'm going to begin this topic with and I'm not sure that I will get to all five of them uh, in this lecture, but I certainly am going to try. The uh, lecture title, Civil Liberties for Me But Not The, uh, was uh, something that I came up with after looking at several decades uh, worth of survey research looking at how Americans view civil liberties, how Americans view democratic values, and uh, there is an incredible uh, disconnect between theory uh, in practice. Uh, it doesn't matter the decade. I actually went back to the 1940s, although there aren't many uh, surveys from the 40s, but 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. In fact, the last one that I looked at was, uh, I don't know, maybe six months uh, ago or so. Uh, the questions vary a little bit, but invariably, uh, Americans are very supportive of both civil liberties and democratic values. Uh, for example, uh, questions that are very general, like uh, I believe uh, in free speech no matter what the speaker's views might be, uh, all individuals are entitled to the same legal rights and protections uh, as anyone else, uh, I believe that elections should be conducted by majority vote, etc. Uh, the questions, as you might guess, are overwhelmingly positive. 95, 96, 97, 98 percent of people say, well, of course. Uh, but what's interesting is that once uh, Americans are surveyed in general how they view about civil liberties, uh, the discussion changes and changes rather dramatically when Americans are then asked to apply these values or to give these values to individuals, to groups, uh, and to ideas that they don't support. Uh, and then the answers are very, very different. So for example, in one uh, research survey, uh, nearly two thirds of Americans said it should be illegal to belong to the least like group so that we can throw them in jail. Uh, in another one, 41% of Americans uh, said that the government should be able to wiretap the phones of members of the least like group so we know what they're doing. Uh, in another survey, almost three quarters of Americans said that members of the least like group should not be allowed to teach in public schools. And so this really supports this notion that there is a real difference between theory and practice. Yes, in theory, we are supportive of civil liberties. Yes, we are supportive of democratic values. However, we are very, very hesitant to extend them to people and ideas uh, that we do not support. So that's the first overview. The second overview is that most civil liberties are found in the Bill of Rights, which are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Uh, I talked about this earlier when I was talking about the Constitution. Uh, remember that a Bill of Rights uh, uh, amendment, if you will, an idea was floated at the Constitutional Convention, uh, and the Bill of Rights were, were basically blown right out of the water. They were not even seriously considered uh, at the Constitutional Convention. So. Uh, instead of being included in the original Constitution, keep in mind the discussion that we had uh, when I was discussing the Constitution. Uh, the Federalists who had supported the new government uh, found that their new government was in trouble. Uh, it was failing in several states. Uh, and so in order uh, to save their structure of government, which they wanted, uh, the Federalists reached out to the Anti-Federalists and said, uh, we will promise to add a Bill of Rights uh, if you will support this Constitution. And it drove a wedge into the Anti-Federalists. Most of the Anti-Federalists still opposed uh, the Constitution, but it won over some crucial people uh, like Thomas Jefferson, like Richard Henry Lee, for example. And so the Constitution was narrowly passed. And uh, James Madison, uh, ended up, uh, I told you the story earlier, he had uh, initially uh, opposed uh, a Bill of Rights. He had opposed the Bill of Rights uh, at the convention. 
His basic argument was about half of our states have Bill of Rights provisions, uh, about half don't. Uh, if states want to abuse the liberties of the people, there is nothing that any paper guarantee is going to do to protect them. Uh, and yet Madison becomes the author uh, of the first 10 amendments. So uh, that third overview that the Bill of Rights were promised and later added to gain support for the Constitution uh, is, uh, uh, is the net result. And remember, uh, I, I said that that battle between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists led to this last important compromise. And, and for you and I as citizens, this may be the most important compromise in the Constitution because most of our basic civil liberties as people are enshrined in the Bill of Rights. And so if you're a First Amendment disciple like I am, speech, press, religion, assembly, petition, uh, or whether you're a Second Amendment disciple and you're a gun owner, uh, or whether you're, you are an advocate for criminal defendant rights in the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth, uh, Hugo Black referred to the Bill of Rights as the Thou Shalt Nots, the Ten Commandments directed at governmental power. Uh, and certainly uh, the Bill of Rights really does address this fundamental tension between how much power or authority should government have and how much liberty or freedom should the individual retain. Uh, the fourth overview that's in your notes Keep in mind that if you look at the first word of the First Amendment, it is very, very clear. It says Congress. Congress shall make no law. And so originally the Bill of Rights were intended to prevent abuses by the national government only. And uh, I always try when I make one of these big points to give you uh, a Supreme Court case to illustrate this. So for the third time this semester, uh, I'm going to ask you uh, to look at our good friend, John Marshall. Uh, I've talked about the Marshall Court uh, twice before. Uh, remember in the first case, uh, we talked about McCulloch versus Maryland and federalism and how John Marshall allowed the U.S. government to charter a national bank. Uh, in the last lecture, uh, in Marbury versus Madison, it was John Marshall that established the doctrine of judicial review in constitutional supremacy. Uh, and now for the third and the last time, uh, I wanna talk uh, about John Marshall in uh, the landmark 1833 case of Barron versus Baltimore. Uh, so Mr. Barron uh, operated a wharf. He supplied ships that came in and out of Boston Harbor. Uh, the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland diverted several streams, uh, and the result of that diversion was it dried up the area around uh, the docks, and uh, it impeded uh, the water flow so greatly that it drove him out of business. Now, the claim that was made by Barron was that if you take a look at the Fifth Amendment, uh, it states that if people are entitled to just compensation, if their private property is taken for public use. Uh, in this particular case, John Marshall uh, ruled that the Fifth Amendment guarantee was only applicable to the actions of the national government uh, and not the legislation of the states. In other words, uh, what Marshall ruled is if the U.S. government had diverted those streams under the Fifth Amendment, Barron would have been entitled to compensation. But because it was the city of Baltimore acting on the direction uh, of the Maryland state legislature, he was not entitled to anything. So let me tell you a Randall story because something very, very similar happened to my grandmother back in Kentucky. Uh, my grandma gave me a call. It was uh, 150 years after Barron versus Baltimore. It was in 1983. Uh, my grandma was upset. Uh, she had uh, received a letter saying that uh, her property was going to be taken. Uh, when I asked her which government, she was unsure. The state fairgrounds was wanting to expand in one direction, the airport in another, uh, and the city in another. Basically, their whole uh, neighborhood was going to be carved up by competing governments, local uh, as well as state. 
I had grandma read me the letters and I had her send me the newspaper clippings. And uh, at the end of the phone call, I told grandma, I go, grandma, I've got kind of good news and bad news for you. And she said, well, what's the bad news? Which is proof that she truly was uh, a Randall. And I said, well, grandma, the bad news is the, uh, the government is going to cut you a check. Uh, they are going to force you to move. Um, they're going to bulldoze your home. There's going to be no trace of its existence. So at this point, she's very upset. And she says, well, well then, honey, what, what could the good news be? And I said, well, Grandma, the good news is, is that uh, this is going to take at least a decade. Uh, there are going to be a whole variety of delays. You have governments fighting. Um, and you and Gra Grandpa won't live uh, to have to move out of your house. And, uh, of course, uh, you would think that uh, this is a horrible thing I'm saying, but Grandma had told me many times that, you know, this was her home. She had lived there since the 1940s. Uh, she wanted to die in this home. Uh, she called out to my grandpa and she said, Paul, Paul, little Richie says we're not going to have to move. And he goes, oh, great. Tell him that's wonderful news. Thank him for me. And Grandma goes, okay, honey. So sure enough, the very next year in 1984, Grandpa died. The years rolled by, 86, 87, 88, 89. We get to 1993. Ten years have passed. Still no sign of her moving. To make a very long and I think kind of interesting story short, uh, in 1995, uh, Grandma was forced to move. And Grandma not only got paid, she got overcompensated. Uh, Grandma got enough money that she was able to get into a bigger house, a three-bedroom home instead of the two-bedroom home she was in, uh, in a slightly better neighborhood. She had enough money left over to buy her last brand new car in cash. And she still had, I think, I don't know, $12,000 that she put into a savings account. So what a difference between these two. Mr. Barron didn't get a dime. He ended up going bankrupt. My grandma not only got paid, she got overly compensated. So the obvious question in this case is, well, what was different about 1993 or 1995 and 1833? Uh, and the answer is in your fifth overview. The fifth overview in your notes is uh, titled the 14th Amendment uh, in the Due Process Clause. Uh, and essentially, if you look at the 14th Amendment, it reads very different than the Bill of Rights. In the Bill of Rights, um, right, it says Congress. Congress shall make no law. It was obviously intended uh, for only the national government. In the case of the 14th Amendment, uh, if you read it, it states very, very different. The 14th Amendment says no state no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. Uh, and so the 14th Amendment has become the vehicle in which the Supreme Court has used what I have labeled in your notes the incorporation doctrine, right? This is a principle in which the Supreme Court has held that most of the guarantees, there are a couple that have not been incorporated yet, but virtually every major guarantee in the Bill of Rights now limits state and local governmental actions by making those guarantees applicable to the states through the Due Process Clause. Now, this did not happen uh, in one fail swoop. Uh, as your notes say, this uh, incorporation occurred gradually and slowly uh, from 1925 uh, to 1972. Uh, this began uh, in the arena of speech. We'll talk about the case of Gitlow versus New York in the next lecture. Uh, that uh, was the first case. Uh, and then freedom of the press in 1931. Uh, and then freedom of religion in two distinct cases in the 1940s. And then we see most of the criminal defendant rights provisions, uh, the fourth, the uh, Fifth and the Eighth Amendments were all incorporated by the Warren Court uh, in the 1960s. So uh, I've gone through your, uh, your first five overviews. Uh, in the next lecture, uh, I will be uh, starting with the First Amendment freedoms. Uh, I will be starting with freedom of speech, and there will be multiple lectures 
uh, talking about freedom of speech, starting with seditious speech.